Hi there, welcome back. Welcome to the second video in the restoration of this uh, Philips F6X95A. And since the last video, I've been doing some checking, obviously checking the circuits that are related to the audio because I want to power this on with the audio tubes in and uh, see what we get, see if we get any uh, sound out of it. Now, I've only got the audio tubes in there and I've got things ready. I've uh, made a few replacements here, not much. The only real changes were the capacitors there, the cathode bypass caps on the ECC83, or both of them, and also the bypass caps on the, where are they, back here, on the uh, EL84s. Now, someone mentioned that uh, some of the smaller resistors were iffy and I did some checking. I was getting within the tolerance that they claimed but I got a bit uh, enthusiastic about getting more precise so I changed some resistors and then I realized that it really wasn't necessary. But I did change a few on here. They weren't completely off but they were sort of 10% off. These are 20% resistors so they were still within their spec but I changed them anyway. But other than that, that was it. So here we have the schematic and as you can see, I've checked the power supply down here and this is all the power amp audio section really. And uh, what we've got here is the two output stages which are identical with an EL84 tube and then we've got the preamp stages. Now this is a pretty straightforward output stage. I'm going to look at one. It'll be very similar to the other. And if we go here, we've got our output there. There's a snubber, well, there's a resistor across the output in case you disconnect your, your speaker. You still end up with a small, with a load. It's a very big load. This probably also has to do with the damping of the output. I'm not so sure. We have a feedback going from the output. So this has got negative feedback to this section here, which is the uh, input of the tube itself. So negative feedback through there. It's a pretty big resistor, 680 kilo ohms. If you wanted to give it more negative feedback, you'd reduce that. That would reduce distortion, but also reduce your, uh, your power output, your level. Now on the primary, what we have is we've got the uh, main power coming in. This is B+. Plus. They call it plus 4. I normally call it plus 1, but it goes in here. It goes in there into the uh, output transformer through the output transformer to the anode of the tube, so it acts as a load for the tube. It also carries on through and comes out here through a little bit of a coil there, which acts as a, an inductor to reduce ripple, and that goes to the second stage of the power, power uh, filtering down below. But if we go here, what we've got is a normal cathode-biased uh, EL84, 130 ohm resistors with 100 uh, microfarad ground, it's a pretty big uh, decoupling cap, cathode bypass cap rather. Usually they're about 50, this one's 100, so more base will go through. We've got a 1K grid stopper here. This uh, pin 9 gets through a 2.2K resistor the uh, uh, screen voltage. Here we've got the grid leak resistor, 680K as well. These are the ones I was too enthusiastic and changed out, but I realized I was being just a little bit too enthusiastic about it. But then anyway, we've got 100k to that point. At this point, we've got a treble pot and the treble pot basically bleeds treble to ground. Um, there's a switch here which will select between, I think this uh, SK6 is the, is the uh, phono input. So this one side gets shorter to ground, whereas that side is just a normal treble pot. Actually, this might be the, this might be, no, it's not. It is the, it is the phono. But anyway, carry on back here. We've got, uh, coming from this stage, from this anode, this is a preamp. It's acting as a preamp. It's half of the ECC83. And that's got a 100K resistor to the B+. Audio comes through there, goes into that circuit. There's some feedback here as well. Yeah, that's feedback that comes through there. It feeds back to this section and it feeds back to here. 
This has got to do with tone shaping, I'm sure. Yeah, it does. Because it feeds to the bottom of that uh, pot there, which is the the base pot in this case. Yep, this is the base. And then it goes back through that resistor and capacitor, which will allow high frequencies through. And another capacitor to couple it to that output of that triode. This triode and that triode, you can see that line there, is cathode biased with one bias resistor and one uh, cathode by bypass cap, also under microfarads. And then you've got the grid leak there and you've got this thing coming to the wiper of the volume pot. The volume pot's got one of those uh, pseudo loudness functions. Somewhere in the pot there's an offshoot which allows some uh, treble to go to ground as well. That then comes down here to the switching. Now the other side is practically the same. This thing here, these two are coupled. Yeah, those two are coupled. So we've got uh, dual pots for treble, dual pots for bass, and here we've got dual pots for, yeah, this is dual pots for the volume. There's this thing coming down here, 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 which actually goes to the stereo switch, stereo mono switch. So if you want mono, you would send it in this side, I presume. This is obviously the, um, the switch that will select between the external inputs down here or the radio section, which is coming from the top here. And obviously the radio section will automatically switch everything into mono. But if you're using stereo, then you feed a signal in here and in here. There is this thing here, this here, this pot here and there is a balance pot. So you can balance left or right. And that's uh, attached to the, it's not attached, it's actually above the volume pot. And it took me a little while to figure out all this sort of stuff, because this is uh, record out and record in and all sorts of stuff. And I was uh, a little bit confused as to which ones to use, but I think I figured it out and I'm ready to feed a signal in here. I'll be leaving the switch on stereo. So the switch will be on stereo. The uh, balance, we'll see how that is. We'll need to get it more or less near the middle. And we'll feed the signal in and see what we get on the output. We'll be able to monitor, hear it, see it on the scope and see what this thing looks like. I'm not sure what the tubes are like. I'm not sure these tubes are in good condition. This is one tube over here. This is two triodes in one envelope. And this is the other tube over here. Now this is... Um, Actually quite interesting because this thing has got two preamp stages. They've used the two triodes of the one tube on each side. So this thing has got a bit more complex audio circuitry than we're normally used to. So let's set this up and see how we get along. Now first of all I'm going to take the signal generator and I'm going to feed it into here and into here because that's the input. I've determined is the input. I want to make uh, both channels have the same audio, so I'm going to just feed the same signal into left and right. The ground is common, so I don't have to double that up, no problem. I've got the speakers connected, and they're connected to the dummy load switcher. So left, right, I've got it on speaker. I've got the outputs from here going up to the scope. They're going to channel 3 and 4 of the scope. It's actually quite useful having a scope with 4 channels, because I can leave these two permanently ready for this connection. This is obviously a one-to-one, -one, so the uh, scope um, probe is set to one-to-one -to -one instead of ten-to-one. These two can be left to ten-to-one, so it makes it very easy. I've got the signal generator with a 600 hertz uh, signal, 100 millivolts, we'll leave it there for now. Let's switch that on. I've got the dim bulb tester with all the lamps on, but there is restriction. So I'll leave it on restriction. I'll put that on. And now, if I hit pickup input, it's come on. I didn't even notice whether the dim bulb flashed or not, but it is on. I've got the switch on stereo. Okay, let me put the volume up and see what we get. Well, I can hear it. 
and I can see it. Actually, I'd rather not hear it. Let me put that on dummy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's try the... This is the um, balance control. It's not exactly the same, is it? seems to be a lot more signal on the one channel than on the other. Let me try it on mono. That's now a mono signal. My balance doesn't work anymore, but what I do find is that I've got a bigger signal on one than on the other. But it's a clean signal. Very clean signal. Let me um, increase the amplitude here to 200 millivolts. Aha, it's starting to clip somewhat. Yeah, it's starting to clip. And that's a very low voltage. That reads half a volt RMS, which is a bit strange. We'll have to see how this thing sounds. That would be uh, with quite a bit of distortion on there already. See that top of the waveform is all crumbled. I go down there. It's a nice sine wave. So, our audio is working. Brilliant. I say brilliant, but there's something wrong with one of these tubes. I'm uh, waiting for an order to arrive with new valves, uh, new tubes. I've got a few EL84s, I've got some uh, 12 uh, AX7s or ECC83s. So when those arrive, I can put it, put it on this radio. I want to get it out with new tubes anyway. And obviously the Bluetooth uh, module will be fitted in here as well. So I want some good audio out of this. And I'll be able to check this discrepancy then. But yeah, this thing is working. This thing's working. And there wasn't... Maybe maybe some of these uh, resistor tolerances actually help that or affect that. But what I do notice is that this thing, uh, when it's in mono, has no effect. Balance control has no effect, obviously. But when it's in stereo, you can see that the two don't go to the same extremes. When you move it to the left and move it to the right, the top ends are slightly different. Okay, well that's fantastic. That's great. I'm happy. So far. So far. Actually, I just had a thought. I'm going to put in the other tubes and I'm going to see if this thing receives anything. Why not? I, I haven't found much wrong with, uh, with resistors or capacitors that I'm too worried about. So I want to see if this thing receives. Let me flip it around, get it ready, put the mini whip in here. The antenna is over there. So I'll put the mini whip in there, leave the speakers connected, put the other tubes in, and see how we go. Let me set it up. All right, mini whip's in at the back. This has only got AM bands, so medium wave, short wave one, two, three, four. I'm not even sure which way around they are. It doesn't matter. Put the volume up. Let's put medium wave. Ominously silent. That does not sound good. Don't hear a peep. Damn. Oh, I do. Okay, that's one of the short waves. I don't know which one. trying. This is probably the bottom end of the band, just after. 
Yeah. This is the one just after the um, broadcast band. Shortwave, the next one. Mm, quiet. Oh no. Ah. And the band spread is working. It's that uh, knob over there. What is that? What the heck is that? What is that light coming on for? Oh, it's picking up very well. Remember, this thing's got an RF amplifier at the front end, so it should pick up quite well. And the band spread is brilliant. Whoa! That is amazing for a shortwave. Okay, next one. Obviously nothing here this time of day. Don't know what that is. Here we go again, that bloody light, what is that? Oh, you know what it is, I've just realized it. I think it's these things over here. Yeah, it's that thing over there. It's when the um, pointer touches that contact up there, then why is the back there? I still haven't figured out what that's for, but this is what it's doing. Okay, I'll figure it out later. Again, broadband uh, band spread works there as well. Oh, there we go. Another switching on point over there, that one there. Is this for all of them? No, it doesn't do it for all the bands. But it was doing it here somewhere. I see one, two, three, four, five, six of those things over there. There we go. That's doing it on that one. But this thing picks up very well. Brilliant. But why is Media Wave not doing anything? Completely. Oh, I just remembered. I've just remembered that thing there. Okay, medium wave will will use the um, ferret antenna, and there's a contact that's broken here. Let me see if I can fix it. I've got to find out whether that thing is showing or not. Hang on. Okay, listen to this. Ah. I'm using this uh, crocodile clip lead just to connect the uh, one end of that coil to that uh, connector that's come loose and we've got medium wave. And of course broadband doesn't work on here. Oh, 
That certainly works. Amazing, amazing sound. Very, very rich. Mind you, it might be the speakers I'm using, but it sounds really, really good. Well, that was a very, very nice surprise. That means that all my tubes uh, on the radio section are working well. And there doesn't seem to be anything dramatically wrong with it, except this thing that I have to connect here permanently. I'll stick that there with some glue and uh, solder that end of that coil. And what am I going to do next? I need to figure out what these things are for. They obviously switch on that light. And I've seen something on the schematic, which might be it, but I'm not sure what it's for. Uh, at certain points in the dial, when the dial pointer touches that, this is probably, the dial point is probably ground, and then that thing makes a connection to ground and switches on the light. But it's at certain places here. I even thought that you could move these around, you know. Maybe the idea could have been, you know, you've got favorite stations here, there, and everywhere. So you can put those where you want to, sort of a station pointer. That would be a good idea, actually. But I don't think it is that because they're fixed. So it might have something to do with the alignment. It might be that the alignment happens at particular points on the dial that correspond. Yeah, yeah it might be that because um, you see that's there and that's at the end and there's one or two, three in the middle. That might have something to do with it, but we'll figure that out as we go along. I'm really happy with this because now it seems my uh, the mystery of whether whether the radio works or not is, is no longer a mystery. It's working. All the bands are working. I need to test some of these bands at different times because obviously this is the evening and during the day you get uh, better reception the higher frequencies and in the evening it goes down. So I'll try that. I need to do a bit more research uh, to figure out how to do the alignment on this because I want to do the alignment on this. This is going to be uh, an IF alignment and I believe this one is uh, the IF frequency is 452 kilohertz which is rather unusual but not too unusual. So I need to figure out how to do the alignment and then I need to finish this up with the Bluetooth uh, module that I need to install on here and at that point we'll be ready for a final test. But uh, I'm going to cut the video short for now and do some research, figure out the alignment, build the module and I'll come back uh, probably for a third and final video very very soon. So I want to thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this, click like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. And uh, bye for now and stay safe.